Donc, on a la chance d'avoir deux, deux, deux experts nationaux, donc euh, Owen Griffiths et Dr. Vincent Florence. Donc, euh, moi, on a eu l'idée de, de ce webinaire-là parce qu'on a reçu du funding, du Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, euh, qui nous fund pour plusieurs projets, donc euh, notamment les projets d'écosystème restoration à Ebony Forest, et aussi pour des cours euh, qu'on donne euh, sur les, la conservation, et aussi, comme je vous ai dit, donc des webinaires pour vulgariser euh, la conservation et passer le knowledge. Donc j'ai eu la chance, euh, il y a presque deux ans maintenant, d'aller faire du snailing avec Owen et Vincent. Donc, euh, moi, je suis un peu néophyte, donc je ne connais pas du tout euh, l'importance des snails, mais je dois dire que je tombe un peu amoureux des snails. Donc, ça vient petit à petit. Donc, il y a peut-être un an, je ne connaissais pas du tout, euh, on dit rien sur les snails, mais après avoir passé du temps avec euh, Vincent et Owen, j'ai appris beaucoup et maintenant, moi-même, je me surprends, je vais à la forêt, je connais reconnaître des snails. Donc, c'est pour ça que je voulais partager cette passion-là avec vous. Donc, parce que souvent, on ne sait pas, on ne connaît pas grand-chose sur les SNES. Donc, on aura, j'espère, l'opportunité, à travers ce webinaire-là, de découvrir un peu plus nos, nos, nos SNES mauriciens. Donc, euh, le, nos deux participants sont Dr. Vincent Florence et Owen Griffiths. Donc, Vincent Florence, on ne présente plus. Donc, euh, notre. Euh, euh, ah oui, je crois que tout le monde te, te connaît, Vincent, euh, je pense. Donc, euh, associé professeur à l'Université de Maurice, donc euh, expert en biodiversité. Euh, il a supervisé beaucoup d'étudiants de, euh, et donc il a une grande connaissance euh, euh, de la biodiversité mauricienne. Et bien sûr, Owen, donc euh, Owen Griffith, c'est le directeur de Ebony Forest de bioculture et aussi de la bannière François Lebas. Donc, Owen, juste pour la petite histoire, Owen est venu à Maurice et à Madagascar pour étudier les, les escargots. Et ensuite, bon, je ne sais pas s'il est tombé amoureux des escargots d'une de, autre personne, mais du coup, depuis, il est resté à Maurice. Et donc, de petit à petit, il, il aimait beaucoup les snails et ça s'est traduit pour ensuite pour commencer à s'intéresser à l'habitat. Et depuis, Owen s'occupe de la restauration de plusieurs sites à Maurice et aussi à Madagascar, par exemple à Maurice, il y a Ebony Forest, Vallée de l'Est. Et à Madagascar, on a trois sites où on travaille. Donc, sans plus vous attendre, je vais passer la parole à Owen. All right, many thanks, Nicolas, for that introduction. I would just like to add one thing that I used to work for many years in the land snail department of the Australian Museum. So uh, that just gives a bit of uh, authority to my background and interest on snails. And welcome to everyone tonight who's, who's participating. It's very encouraging to see this interest in land snails. It's interesting, about 100 years ago, there were large numbers of people around the world who were interested in snails. They were interested in snails from a, uh, just the beauty of snail shells, but also interested in describing new species and studying new species. And then it sort of died out. And, and interest in snails, I have to say, is, is um, uh, quite restricted these days, which is a shame because land snails are an incredibly important part of uh, global biodiversity and global environments. They play a very important role um, in the ecosystem as, as um, plant material degraders and recyclers and other functions as well. But sometimes I get a bit annoyed when people just put a tag on an animal as being very important for the ecosystem because in their own right, they're just such an extraordinary part of global biodiversity. And you'll see that in a few minutes. So let me just see if I can set this thing up. So I'm gonna share screen and I'm going to... Do, 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 do. Right, are we good, Nicola? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Oh, it's showing for me. It didn't work for you? Okay, just give me a second. I did hit share screen. Uh, 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 uh. So it's not in yet for you? Not in. Okay, now it's getting okay, now it's going. Okay. Okay, and let me just put it on full. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about obviously the land snails of the Southwest Indian Ocean. 
Of course, when people talk about snails globally, if they know anything about snails, they usually think of them as part of the global restaurant trade. And of course, they're not wrong in that observation because snails represent a trade of about 200 million US dollars globally. And it's concentrated on members of the, of the genus Helix, which are found in Europe or endemic to Europe and to Western Asia. But increasingly, the Mauritian, although it's not native, but the snail that you will be familiar with in Mauritius, the Gorkulpa, Akatina, is also in trade in the value of many tens of tens of millions of dollars. And on the left, you can see canned Akatina here and Gorkulpa. But that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in, as we said, is the endemic snails of the Southwest Indian Ocean. And I've cast the net a little bit wider and included the Camores and the Seychelles. So if you glance here, uh, there's close to 1,500 1, identified, known, described land snails from this part of the world, which is an extraordinary diverse diversity. And most of them, well over half of them are endemic, i.e. found nowhere else in the region. So let's dive in and talk a little bit more about that. The snail fauna of this part of the world is actually relatively well known. A large percentage of the snails have been scientifically identified and named. And the study of snails in the Southwest Indian Ocean is actually quite old. So the first snail described in Mauritius was described in 1774, Plicodomus sulcatus, which is critically endangered, but still survives to this day. And there's a picture of it at the bottom left. In the middle is the first snail described from Madagascar, Tropidifora tricarinata. In the, and again, that's a species of snail that miraculously survives to this day. And on the right is uh, Stala not unidentata, the first snail described from the Seychelles in 1802. Although most of the snails or many of the snails have been described, there are still new species being found all the time. And in fact, I have in preparation with a colleague from the UK, uh, a, a new paper describing several new species of snail discovered in a small area of limestone in the northwest of Madagascar. And Vance and myself have in preparation a paper describing another six mascarine snails. So let's talk a little bit about collecting snails. Where do you find snails? In the mascarines and in Madagascar and in the Seychelles, in fact, uh, in the whole of the Southwest Indian Ocean region, most of the snails people encounter in their gardens, in their fields, et cetera, are introduced snails. And the native snails are just confined to areas of native forest. So if you're interested in native snails, the first thing is to find some native forest degraded or in good state. And then, although the largest snails are the ones that clearly that are most obvious, the largest number of species are smaller snails. So what you would traditionally do is you'd go, you'd take a leaf litter sample, uh, sieve it, sort it under the microscope and come up with um, the species that you are surveying. But we shouldn't forget that in the Southwest Indian Ocean, sadly, many snails have become extinct. So you need to look at sub-fossil sites also. And in the bottom right-hand side of this picture is a Pachystyla versicolor, which is a species that still survives to this day and is critically endangered. And here's one in a bit of calcarinite rock that was found on Ilofono in Gampur. So looking for sub-fossil sites for extinct snails is also very important. And as I said to you before, there's been a lot of publications, a lot of research done on the snails of this part of the world. And here's just a few. Uh, a review by Justin Gerlach of the snails of the Seychelles. Uh, in 1994, the Paris Museum did a really fabulous summary of all that was known to that date on the land snails of Madagascar. Uh, there's been publications on the land snails of Moors. And this color plate here is a a paper published in the 1990s describing a whole suite of new species of snails from Madagascar. So the knowledge is, is there. There's a lot of work that's been done already on this part of the world. Okay, we're gonna start now with a more detailed description island by island. Madagascar has, as I mentioned before, an extraordinary 
number and diversity of land snails. 1,100 species described to date, and that's growing quite a lot. The reason for this large diversity of snails, and of course a very high percentage are endemic, found nowhere else in the world, is number one, Madagascar's large size. Number two, related to that is the diversity of habitats. You have montane forest, lowland rainforest, montane rainforest, dry forest, desert forest, etc. And all these areas are colonized by different species of snail. And the fact that it's such an ancient landmass, Gondwana landmass, means that snails, many species have had time to diversify and evolve. And in this picture, we just show a few of the, of the really iconic species. Madagascar has what's called bird egg snails. And as the name suggests, they lay these humongous eggs. So here's the egg of this species of snail, uh, Helicophanta magnifica, lays a snail. I, I feel sorry for the female snail when she has to give birth to this relatively huge egg in, in, in relationship to, to her size. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the largest operculant land snails in the world, this species, Tropifora cuveriana, uh, was described very early on in the 1800s, but no one knew where it came from. And it was only in the 1960s that it was discovered that it comes from a small limestone area in the northwest of Madagascar called Ankarana. And this snail sits on vertical limestone surfaces and grazes the microalgae that grows on those surfaces. And it is perhaps one of the most secure land snails in Madagascar because these limestone areas are very inhospitable to humans and the habitat is now a national park. But if you look at the photo on the bottom right, you can see a suite of, of the different forms of the larger of Madagascar's land snails. And also there are large numbers of very small species. And as I mentioned before, Every new expedition to Madagascar going to small relic areas of forests that haven't been surveyed before turn up new species after new species. Madagascar has also the largest tree snail in the world. So most snails are, are, are terrestrial. There are, of course, species that spend their entire lives arboreally in many parts of the world, usually in tropical or subtropical forests. And the one on the left here, property for a Salberiana, uh, occurs in the rainforests of eastern Madagascar. In addition, this quite lovely snail here on the right, Helicophanta gudutiana, is from the really dry forests of the west coast, and it can live months and months and months east of eating, buried deep in the soil, waiting for the very infrequent rains. And then it comes up, mates, feeds, lays its eggs, and then will dig back down under and wait through the dry season till the next, um, next bit of rain very important strategy for snails living in, in arid areas. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about Mauritian snails. So Mauritius, compared to Madagascar, vastly less snails, 125 species, but as I mentioned before, quite a high percentage of endemism. Snails found nowhere else in the world. The relatively small number of snails, unlike Madagascar, is because Mauritius is relatively young, maybe about 7 million years old, and relatively small. But nonetheless, it's got quite a diversified snail fauna. Most of the snails, as I said, uh, that you will come across in your garden are introduced. And here are some of the key ones. We've got uh, um, Acatina immaculata. Now this is a left-hand coiling rare individual. Most of them are right-hand coiling. We've got property for, uh, I'm sorry, we've got Acatina uh, uh, here, uh, Acatina fulica. We've got Euglandina rosea. Now, Euglandina, Euglandina rosea is an example of a catastrophic biocontrol exercise. In the 1960s, people wanted to control Acatina as an agricultural pest all around the world. So they found a carnivorous snail in Florida, and they thought all we need to do is introduce a carnivorous snail to Mauritius and elsewhere in the world, and it will eat Acatina. They didn't do their studies properly. Euglandina prefers to eat other species of snails. And in many parts of the world, it has become a pest itself because it exterminates native snails and leaves Acatina alone. Linked to that failed biocontrol exercise was the introduction of a carnivorous snail from Kenya, this one here, Ganaxis. It's been less of a, of a problem, but also it failed to control Acatina. 
Uh, we also have the Petit Gris from France. We have Macroclamus indica from, uh, from India, as the name suggests. So these are the snails you will be familiar with in your garden. None of them are Mauritian and feel free to squash them all. Acatina, of course, is normally these days relatively small, but you can see from this individual here that periodically they get to a very large size. Now here, on, on the, this, this shot on the right is a series of Mauritian snails. And I'm just gonna quickly mention a few of them. This particular one here uh, has a plegma, was described only from dead shells. It was already extinct when scientists found it. However, the fact that there were some fairly fresh snails found in the 1860s suggests it survived until about then. And we have specimens collected in about the 1300s, I'm sorry, dated from the 1300s, collected recently, that have been predated by rats. And it's almost certainly that rats took out this species. Lucky style of bicolor, which Vance or Nicola will be talking about later on, sort of the, 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 the key Mauritian snail, uh, critically endangered, declining fast, but used to be in large numbers. The other one I want to mention specifically is this fabulous snail here, Gibbous lion etianus. This is sort of the iconic snail for snail collectors around the world from Mauritius with its very unusual triangular shape. This snail was thought to be extinct in the 1900s and then a collector went to um, near Bassin Blanc and he spoke to some locals and some locals within half a day had found 20 live individuals. But unfortunately, that's the last recorded live of this species and it is now definitely extinct and almost certainly taken out by pigs and rats and tenrex because with its shape, it would have lived just under fallen leaves and was incapable of hiding deep in the soil or in rock piles or anything like that. And on the left-hand side, you can see a scientific research collector's a drawer with specimens, species by species, the smaller ones in the tubes, the larger ones in the trays, all of them carefully registered so that we know where each snail came from. Uh, we have the biodata about each individual. All right, very briefly for the snails of Rodrigues and Reunion. Reunion, even though it's bigger than Mauritius, has only 58 native species of snail, which would seem to be a bit of a paradox. And of those 58 species, most of them are actually closely related to Mauritian snails. So how do you explain that? The conventional wisdom is, although Reunion can be considered to be a very old island compared to Mauritius, it was also recently vulcanized in the sense that about 80,000 years ago, there was a cataclysmic volcanic eruption that seems to have wiped out everything on the island. So the snails that you have there recolonized Reunion in the last 80,000 years, and most of them from Mauritius, and most of them have analogous species on Mauritius. Rodrigues, Again, a very old island, very remote, only 30 species, but very different from those elsewhere in the Mascarenes. The low number of species reflects its isolation, so difficult for species to colonize Rodrigues. They reflect the fact that um, it's a very small island with not very many habitat types, so not many opportunities for snails to diverge once they get there. The largest snail, Sigma buscheriana, extinct, only ever known extinct. So probably died out early on in the colonization period. Um, this Colparian died out in the 1950s. It was collected until the 1950s. So we think this was taken out by Euglandina uh, and these Tropidiphoras survive, but just hanging on. And they also have this carnivorous snail amongst others. Up here, uh, Plegma uh, rodrigensis is on the brink of extinction. So we're trying to set up a, a, a captive breeding program for that. The trouble is, it hasn't been seen alive since 1989. And again, probably taken out by you, Glandina. This is a, a challenge for us in the future. Sorry. Just a few live animal shots. So you can see here from the live animals that, the, that they have a, a lot of diversity and some of them are really brightly colored, as you can see here. Uh, the suite of species are, up here are all carnivorous snails from Mauritius, and Mauritius has an extraordinary diversity of carnivorous snails. Euglandina we talked about, which is the introduced biocontrol species, as is Gonaxis. Kistala, which is the critically endangered one, uh, an arboreal native semi-slug, and this is the largest snail surviving on reunion. 
a Michaela Chura. All right, now what's happening on the Seychelles? The Seychelles has 69 species of snail. So given that the Seychelles is a very ancient island group, it's quite uh, strange that it has relatively few snail species. But again, this is to do with their isolation and the small size of the island. But what they do have is highly evolved, very ancient, and unlike much in the region. And the two iconic species from the Seychelles are this one here, Unidentata, and this one here, uh, Studeriana, which are a Gondwana land relic snail. And both of them are oviviparous. In other words, they develop an egg inside their brood cavity, and then the egg hatches out inside the brood cavity, and the mother snail gives birth to a small, um, fully developed baby snail. My last slide is just to talk about when you look at snails, you also look at snail ecosystem interactions. And what do I mean by that is that obviously snails interact with other species in the ecosystem and um, they give you an insight onto what was going on when the snails were about, especially in the, in the case of extinct snails. So if you look on the left and the right, we have two species of snail. The one on the right is extinct and the one on the left is critically endangered. With these very standard drill holes in the shell. It's almost like someone has deliberately drilled the hole to string them into a necklace, but this is not the case. This is the entry, correct me if I'm wrong, Vance, it's the ent entry or the exit hole of the larvae of an extinct beetle appropriately called drillus. And in the middle, you can see these, this is an extinct snail, Tropidifora carinata, and this very characteristic depredation mark on the underside. And this is considered to be the feeding marks of the extinct bird, the red rail, which seemed to have been almost a snail specialist. And with that, I think I've given you a fairly good introduction to the snails of the Southwest Indian Ocean. Um, so I'm going to press stop, share, and go back to Nicola. Thanks. Thank you very much, Owen. So what I would suggest is that uh, if we have questions, we keep it for the end, and then we can just answer the question. So I just uh, pass to uh, Vincent to continue your presentation. OK, OK, thanks. I was, I was busy clapping. Wait, I, I removed my claps. Uh, where are they? Oh my gosh, I lost it. Oh, sorry, I'll be clapping all around. I don't want to clap for myself. Just a minute, just a minute. Uh, oh, where is it? I lost you. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's better. All right, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Good uh, evening. So just give me a sec. I'll share screen. It's been a long time. I didn't have lectures, so. I'm kind of rusted. Um, okay. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So uh, first, I mean, I, I just start my chronometer. All right. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, uh, just a minute. Just a minute, Claudia. Is an echo. Yes. Come over here. Uh, so, sorry. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for having me uh, on this, uh, inviting me for this presentation. So, um, I will be talking about the frets. I've been asked to talk about the frets to Mauritian snails. I mean, uh, Owen has introduced the diversity already. So uh, just in case anyone doesn't know uh, who I am, I have put my name here and I am from a, a small polar research at the university, a Tropical Island Biodiversity Ecology and Conservation Polar Research. And I put it, a, a, a photo of a forest, um, which may be surprising um, to talk about snails, but in fact, basically what I mean here is that this is the real, the, the habitat of the large number uh, of the snails that survive today. Uh, a few other species occur in, in coastal areas, et cetera, but in native vegetation most of the time. That's the natural habitat. So basically, just already a little hint, if you want to conserve um, uh, native snails, conserving their habitat uh, is, a, is a must. So if you get closer to these, uh, to these forests, you see, for example, a tree here. And what you can see, you can see a lot of you know, lichen, mosses. You can see quite a lot of uh, diversity there, ferns. There are insects, 
uh, birds, fungus, spiders, and that's where the snail is also. It's part of all this uh, whole ecosystem, like Owen just said, finishing uh, on, the, uh, on, on the interactions. So it means that the snail is uh, really uh, interacting with a lot of other species in this ecosystem. So today, therefore, I'm going to talk about um, what, um, what is making that uh, species on the left, like uh, Gonospira holostoma here, an adult, about eight mil, um, um, just um, uh, a carnivorous endemic snails from, from Mauritius, how that is actually being turned into a species like on the right, which is an extinct species that was still surviving about 150 years ago in the south coast of Mauritius. Um, so what, what human impact is doing that change, is causing extinction, is causing threat to these species um, to the point of driving whole species extinct, like the dodo. So, but before we dig, dig, um, dwell into that, it's important to have, to realize that not all, all species actually uh, of snails are necessarily uh, prone to the same threats. Some are very large, like the Pakistala here, and some are much smaller, like Gastrocopta microscopica. I just gave you a, you know, a scale here in the same hand. So obviously, because they're very different sizes, they will be having different, um, uh, facing different threats. For example, a rat might go and eat this one, but would not even see this one, would not be interested. So just one example. So bear that in mind that not all species have the same uh, threats uh, uh, against them. Just to make sure that you see the snail, that's, that's a close up of that same little snail. It's about 2.4 uh, millimeters long, but it's not the smallest. And this species is 1.2 millimeter long. It's named after Jean-Claude Sébastien, whom I think many of you would know. The other example of differences is some species are arboreal, like the top here, Amphalatopis major, living in the on the leaves and feeding on, on small uh, epiphytes or philophytes, and others are on the ground, for example, just under the dichotomy. So they will, of course, not again be facing the same kind of threats. Um, right, so this said, um, it's important to um, put the context right in our, we are in a biodiversity spot. Owen has already um, stressed on that. So Mauritius is part of that biodiversity hotspot. And um, it's important also to realize that we are, uh, we already have quite a lot of extinction. We are basically the, uh, Mauritius is a capital of extinction in the Southern hemisphere, Hawaii being the other one in the other hemisphere. So we are one, uh, the, one of the countries with the highest rate of extinction. And within this uh, context, uh, as you can see here, I put four groups in to compare between them. Uh, for example, plants have the lowest rate of extinction, reptiles and birds more or less equal, about 25%, but uh, snails are worst. Um, so snails are, tend to be more, more prone to extinction relative to the other groups, that we, the, the main groups that we know, for example, okay? So the other things which are perhaps are also interesting to flag uh, early on, and then we go into the detail uh, of the mechanisms, why these species are uh, threatened with extinction, is that there are trends, there are patterns that exist. Uh, again, this stresses the idea that not all species are equally prone to extinction. Some are more, others are less. And that's quite important to know these patterns because then we can direct our conservation action uh, in a more impactful manner. So for example, here, this graph shows us the percentage of extinct species per family of snail in Mauritius and the percent of endemic species per family. So what you can see therefore, there is a positive correlation between the proportion of endemic and the proportion of extinct species in a given family. So that's bad news because of course it means that the endemic species are more prone to extinction relative to the non-endemic ones. And when we lose an endemic species in Mauritius, we have lost it from the earth. So now we come to some of the threats. I have categorized a few threats like that. Some of them uh, are dealt with in very, very briefly, like habitat destruction um, and, and fragmentation that comes with it. I think there's only one slide because of course, uh, nothing is, uh, can be um, uh, more direct and um, immediate 
as habitat destruction in, in destroying biodiversity because you destroy the, the living space of the species. You know, you take a forest, you turn it into a parking lot, your snail's gone. So um, it's the most serious threat, but it is important to realize also that um, Mauritius is pretty special in that because we are one, we are one of the countries, one of the territories in, on the planet has been reached last by humans. We were pristine till very late, whereas most of the places had already got a massive human impacts on them. But then um, we destroyed our habitat extremely fast. So today we are among the most destroyed um, islands or territories in the whole world. We have destroyed more than 95% of the habitats and it is unfortunately still going on, although on a smaller scale because we don't have much to destroy left. So, uh, but even we, we have some cases, for example, in, in not, not too many years ago, even destruction of habitat within protected uh, nature reserves like Cabinet Nature Reserve. So that is, of course, a major driver of uh, species and biodiversity loss, not just snails, but many other species as well. But snails, perhaps even more, because they can't move, they can't displace from a, an area we deforested and move to some other areas like birds could do, for example. Right. So the other aspect, and that is a much longer one, is, is predation by invasive alien species. I have not been exhaustive on that. I've not put, uh, there are a couple of papers, uh, uh, including uh, with Owen as well, uh, where we have reviewed some uh, impact of uh, some predators, um, flatworms, that, uh, and also and, and, uh, exotic snails, introduced snails, like, like been mentioned by Owen earlier. Um, the rosy wolf snail. The, um, there's a paper this year, uh, Gerlach et al. in biological invasion. You may, you may like to have a look at that. There's another paper also talking about the, the toads uh, and its diet, also published this year that mentioned the snails, uh, how snails are, uh, constitute a, a fair share of the, the toad's diet. So, uh, but here I've just put some uh, vertebrate um, predators, the toad, the macaque, the tenrec, shrew, rats. We have two species of rats among others. Um, and when you look at the extinct species, some of which uh, we already been introduced to, or all three actually or, uh, in the previous talk. So uh, plegma, gibbous, uh, tropidophora, um, you, you, re, you, you notice a pattern with them. There's, uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse. Uh, here you can see uh, it's broken up in the, in the top left side. It's broken up the same way. The shell is broken up in the same manner. Here, if you look closely, that, that shell, it has a suture. You know, the suture is where the two worlds actually join each other, successive worlds. Usually it's a line of weakness. When the shell degrades, it will... Um, break along this line typically. But when it is chomped by teeth, it will break in different places as exactly seen here. You can see that the jarred uh, edges of the second whorl of the shell has been crushed, therefore chewed by some mammalian teeth. And here again, you can see this kind of pattern. This area, this area of the shell was apparently easiest to, to crunch by the animal, the predator was uh, eating it here. So you do have uh, signs of predation. And as Owen also mentioned, um, very um, you know, rat predation on, on uh, extinct snails have been uh, established as well from very early on. So the uh, predation by itself is not a bad thing. Of course, it, it, in nature, you have predation. Um, just like for you know other interactions like parasitism, competition, etc., they're not bad per se. They don't actually uh, drive species extinct typically uh, when they are played out among species which have co-evolved with each other, which have coexisted with each other. This is to the test of time. This interaction is able to stabilize with all the species, predator and prey, surviving. 
And, and typically why? Because of course, when the predator eats a bit too much of the prey, the prey becomes a bit rare and then it's harder to find. Therefore, uh, the predator gets less food. Therefore, it has less babies. Therefore, its population drops. It's kind of the Loika Volterra uh, uh, oscillation. So there is a kind of inbuilt um, regulation of prey and predator uh, populations in natural systems. But this situation is um, disrupted when you bring in alien species. Because alien species, especially like rats, for example, if you're eating the, 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 the shell, the snail, uh, and the snails start becoming rare, they can be eating seeds, they can be eating a lot of other things. They're very generalist. So they don't go into that um, um, food scarcity situation as would have happened usually for among native species typically. So basically they continue to exert a lot of pressure. And also, of course, they are new to the system. Therefore, um, the prey species are not pre-adapted to, to um, avoid or, or, or discourage this kind of predation. And they can discourage, they can avoid it by behavior, for example, or they can avoid it uh, or discourage it by being unpalatable, all these things through evolution could have actually uh, evolved. But when you bring in invasive species, you don't have their chance to have that. So basically uh, the um, predation is extremely uh, lethal. And that's what is, that, that's, the graph is showing that. Uh, on, on this graph, you can see the live record is none, it's gone in green. Red is uh, dead only, and also it's, there are some, some fossils and some, uh, you know, in Marosong is shown here, which is uh, uh, about 4,000 years old, and the, the uh, yellow ones 5,000 years old or more. So it gives you an idea that this thing was actually quite widespread and it has actually gone extinct all over the, the, the country. The last uh, uh, living animals were actually found lower down here um, about 150 years ago. So now if you look at the uh, um, currently surviving species, but um, on the brink of extinction, uh, threatened species, you have a gonidomus, you have picadomus, which we've seen already before. And also this one we've seen already before. Again, you see the same thing. You see this jarred, the uh, squashed shell. And here you can see the same pattern of crunching by predator. Same here by their, um, for the uh, um, uh, Tropidophora. A couple of them had escaped their predation, but many of them, you see that the rat has been yawing uh, up and up and up the shell until it can just get the whole animal out and stop yawing the shell. So they are very, very potent predators to which the snail was not adapted. And this little photo here is just uh, a bit special because it gives you an idea. This is an ab absolute um, exact proportion of snail that was collected. I did that photo exactly for this. Like I was collecting snails and I kept the proportion of the different types of damage and how many were whole and how many were eaten. It gives you an idea that if you look well, um, you know, if you can, you can just count it, the vast majority of these snails have been eaten and in a, in a given manner from the tip, have been uh, chomped at the tip. And some of them has been eaten uh, in a, a transversal manner. And some of them, unfortunately, you can see eggs still inside some of them. So it's, you know, you just, you're killing, uh, of course, uh, reproductive individuals here as well, because they're all adult. And only two of them died of other causes than their predation by this rat. And the geographical um, outcome of this, what you can see here, again, same language, uh, red dot is uh, dead only, and green dots are alive. So this, this species has been restricted very much now. It's only in a small uh, area. So, um, and even in these places, we found very few individuals. So this is how extinction is happening. Basically, extinction of a species is basically the last local extinction. And what each of these red dots means here, it's one local extinction because they're different, they're distinct and far from the others. They are distinct populations, most likely, and they have gone extinct. So the last local extinction is the global extinction for an endemic 
like that. So, and that's where we are almost at the doorstep of, in case of Erepta Stalodon, the only live place uh, um, in the recent uh, um, 50, 70 years, or even more, live uh, spot we found it is uh, Brisfair Mountain. We have found some fresh dead here and there, but when you count live records, it's really on the brink of extinction, just one area. Although that species was quite widespread. And you can see here a shell, fresh shell, also fresh, cut into two, eaten up by uh, um, predators. Now, um, what is interesting is that uh, when you look at trends, if you take, for example, the streptaxid, which is the, the, the gonospira, for example, uh, one example here, long cigar-shaped snails. If you look at the um, maximum dimension, that is a length in that case of that, of that, uh, of that uh, snail, it technically it's called the height, but uh, you know, let's, let's call it the length because it's long. Right, uh, so, um, and you, you plot the maximum dimension of the species with the percentage of shell that is found to be eaten up. And what you see is a very clear correlation. That is, the bigger the snail species, the more, uh, the harder it is hit by predators. That when it's small, it is less and less taken. When it's very small, it is not taken at all by the predator. So you can see that predator, mammalian predator, would actually attack the, the bigger ones. And it goes worse and worse the bigger you are. So it's no big surprise that most larger species have actually gone extinct. So now I'll move on to competition. We don't know much about competition, but uh, I have this photo to share with you. It's uh, a bit fat acatina or lisa acatina uh, here which is basically feeding on a fruit of a uh, tombalacoc, a fallen fruit. And you can see that a poor little uh, endemic here is trying to get a share as well. But when you see this one chomping through, there's very little chance for it to actually be able to outcompete the big one. The big one in competition, typically, the, the bigger, the better. The bigger uh, wins. This is what we call asymmetric competition. Typically, this one will actually be eating far more than this small one and far faster. And also, it will be commoner. They will, therefore, as a population, it will eat the resource uh, faster. So basically, already these snails are facing all kind of threats. You know, a toads are feeding on the babies. Uh, rats are eating their juveniles. Uh, maybe pigs are, are crunching the adults. And then uh, exotic snails are actually uh, competing with their with their food. There is also climate change drying up the, the environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of threats are, are operating at the same time. We, but we don't know much about competition. It's, it's a bit difficult to actually put a finger on the exact impact of competition, but it's very likely to be happening because by the sheer biomass of these exotic uh, snails, uh, they must be taking uh, resources that the native are therefore not able to get. So Pakistan bicolor is one of the most uh, widespread species, uh, again, uh, still in Mauritius, as you can see here, the green uh, spots, but it is already also disappearing from a number of uh, localities. So uh, local extinction is going on. So a few um, couple of slides, or one slide, I think, on climate change, just to say something quickly on that. Uh, it's a major, major problem, obviously. Um, it is more medium, longer term, but it's already impacting us. Um, two things I would like to say. First, there is a, as you can see in this graph here, there is um, temperature is increasing. That's, there's, very, there's no doubt about it. It has increased by more than a degree uh, over about 50 years. And here, rainfall, overall rainfall has dropped over uh, Mauritius, but it's more complex than that in terms of you know, the detail of it. For example, here, the coastal, the, the lower, lower areas on the, on the east, uh, the, the arrow points upward. So it's getting wetter. The trend is getting wetter, the rate of change millimeter per year is getting wetter by more than four millimeters. The uh, upper areas are getting drier. So basically the kind of uniformization of this environment, of course, the lowland is still drier than the uplands, but these climate shifts are changing what it used to be. So basically you have to realize that the snails, as many other species as well, they have been adapting to this environment but now they're getting less and less rainfall in the upland and more and more rainfall in the lowland. At the same time, you're having higher temperature, which means you have more evaporation. So therefore the drying up is accelerated. And this dry up is accelerated 
even more by habitat fragmentation, the fact that we have uh, destroyed a forest, the microclimatic effect. Here we are talking about climatic effect, but there's also the microclimatic effect. So a lot of these things are happening at the same time, and that's not good for snails. Snails like moisture. Now, one idea, one example of poor management, I could not resist saying that because, of course, it's very, uh, it's very topical for Mauritius. It's quite a, uh, the only place in the world doing that is basically we are uh, killing bats and oh, you might say, huh, what, what's the link with snails? Well, there's a very interesting link actually because uh, it also teaches us about ecology. Ecology things are linked with each other. So basically the bat is a, uh, is a threatened species uh, endemic to the mascarine, is being masculine uh, in a repeated manner. And we know that when they, are, uh, they have lower density, their ecological function is reduced. They are not able to uh, pollinate plants, but above all, um, disseminate seeds of plants as much as if they were more numerous. Uh, the mechanism of that is explained by um, um, the papers by um, McConkey and Drake, a very seminal paper on that. So it's very clear. It's like uh, bats stop being dispersers well before they become rare. Uh, I, I, something like that, the title. So you, I, I recommend to read that. It's a very interesting paper. So why is that important? Because of course, uh, the bats here, they uh, feed, we, we've seen that they feed on, on one quarter of the, uh, uh, on the fruit of one quarter of the species of trees in Mauritius, representing half of the individual plants of the forest, of any given forest that we have studied. We have studied five forests of any given forest. It, it's about one tree out of two, 53% to be exact on average, uh, are serviced by the bats, have their fruit eaten by the bats. And if you talk, talk about biomass, it's 63%. So basically the majority of the biomass of the forest, the woody plants, are serviced by the bats. The fruit are eaten by the bats, the seeds are disseminated by the bats. And seed dissemination is extremely important for regeneration. You, you won't have proper regeneration if you don't disseminate the seeds well. And the dodo is extinct, the tortoise is extinct, the other large bat is extinct, so it's the only bat now able to disseminate the seed of many different species. So if we kill that, that animal, we uh, weaken the ability of the forest to regenerate. And uh, even if the species is still uh, not, is not extinct, we will still weaken it. Um, and that has longer term uh, negative influence on uh, the ecosystem. And one example of that I invite you to read, uh, Albert et al, 2020, uh, Journal of Ecology, um, too complex to explain that, uh, that graph perhaps, but uh, I invite you to read it. It, it basically, the, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, or maybe in a snail shell, uh, animal extinction caused plant declines. That's what it means. So you, can, you can see that. And uh, um, it's very interesting, it applies to Mauritius very much. Now, the last bit is alien plant invasion, degrading habitat quality, a lot of invasion, uh, a very intense invasion in Mauritian forest. Uh, this, um, you know, you, you see that, is, all this is exotic plant, this is one native here. That's, that's the best forest of Mauritius. And in a graph, it looks like this. The aliens, in terms of density, you can see the proportion here vis-a-vis -vis of the native. The native start becoming dominant only among trees which are about five uh, to six cent uh, centimeters in diameter of trunk, but um, crushingly dominant, uh, dominated by exotics in the understory, and that reduces regeneration very much. So what we have looked at, we, we studied uh, the, the forest, we look at 16, more than 16,000 native plants, including in uh, Ebony Forest, in Kamnizar, and other places as well, we have seen that there's a very clear trend where uh, native woody plants, uh, basal area, uh, species richness, and uh, um, individual density, they all decline when the importance of alien plant increases in the forest. So there is a, a very clear negative uh, correlation between the two. And overall, what does that actually lead to? We have seen that uh, thanks to plots that were surveyed in 1930s by Vaughan and Vier, we were able to compare 68 years later, we found that these plots, although they're in protected area, they have lost one tree out of every two in 68 years within protected area. So 
there is an inexorable loss of uh, trees in the forest. Therefore, the, the habitat is, is degrading, and that is degrading for the snails as well, and any other biodiversity. It's also bad, of course, for the plants, but it's also bad for all inhabitants of this uh, native forest. The more so that it's important to realize that we have a situation where there's a kind of uh, acceleration, a, a, fee, a feedback loop happening. When, when these trees die, there is more uh, in, uh, light coming in, invasion increases, there's more um, drying up um, of the environment, there's less fruits uh, for feeding the animals, etc. So um, there are many feed, feedback loops that actually accelerate degradation. So we have dying forests in, um, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's safe to say that most of the species in Mauritius are actually on a decline um, because of that. And one example of, of that for snails is uh, Omphalotropis aplicosa, again, where it has disappeared and where it survives. But I plotted this time the type of forest where it had disappeared and where it survives. You can see very clearly that there's a trend where it survives only in higher quality forests. This is native forest cover. This is grade A, grade one cover you know, grade two, grade three, et cetera, and no, no for us at all. So this is where you have the old dead and this is where you have the live one. So they survive in the well-preserved forest and they disappear when the forests start degrading. So we do therefore conservation management, as we all know, uh, removing the weeds. The weeding is extremely positive. Uh, I'm about to finish uh, a, uh, a few more slides. Um, very beneficial to the forest. You know, look at that. Uh, these are plots that we have sampled in the forest and we followed for time, 14 years. They are control plots. That is a plot without weeding and plot with weeding. So without weeding, there's an inexorable decline as we expect from what the long-term study showed us. With weeding, you have the exact opposite. And these plots are next to each other on either side of a, of a road. So it's exactly the same uh, climate, same, um, environments, rock and uh, vegetation type, etc. So very comparable uh, control experiment. You see that the native plants almost double. Within, there's no planting at all there. Just weed the, the forest, and the number of native stems doubled in 14 years, whereas it's going down in uh, invaded areas. So it's very good news, except that for each hectare you have in the green, you have 20 hectares in the red. So basically. It's like making one step forward and 20 steps backward. So overall, you're going backward. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. So now uh, I think um, um, the uh, next talk will be about conservation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. So, like I said, we'll keep the question for the end. Then we can just uh, have a longer day and not be cut. And I've seen a bit most of it. So. I'm going now to pre present on conservation of snails. Okay. So first, I, I really like this picture of uh, painting of Julian Ulm, where we see the dodo and, and the dodo. And what is very interesting is that if you look down here, you have snails. And lots of time when we done conservation in Mauritius, we focus a lot on forest restoration, also a lot on birds and reptiles, but not much has been done on snails or even invertebrates. So when I, I try, when we're looking and I look for, and we didn't see any project that was done in Mauritius in terms of snail conservation, at least anything public. So like Owen said earlier on, so we live in a variety of different forests, wet, mesic, dry. So mesic means where you have a bit of humidity and we are more, we used to have more than 125 species of native snails. And it is estimated now that between 50 to 90% uh, of these species have gone extinct. And what was responsible for the extinction? And thanks to Vincent, we've seen most of it. So I'm just going to, quickly go through, so habitat loss and degradation. And we used to have collection of snail by humans, so that has stopped, but there's uh, uh, records that uh, locals used to go in the forest 
and collect uh, big bags of pakisala and bring them to feed pigs and other animals. So to tell you that there was a very high density of snails, but that has lost. But now we see there's a bit less of this collection. It's a bit less of a problem compared to predation by introduced animals or competition with non-native snail or even climate change as mentioned just showed us. But if that's factors we know, but one thing that we know is that we know that we don't know much about the snails. So for example, we, have, we had really limited information on their reproduction. So we work on one species, the Pakistara bipolo, and we found out that, for example, it had a slow reproduction rate compared to exotic species. And we also, we don't know much about the lifespan and age of reproduction for most species. We know now a bit more about Pakistara bipolo, but what we can say is that we don't know much about this species. So that's one thing you first you need to know is that if you want to save any species, you need to know your species. You need to know its last span, its biology. And that's where we're already missing because we don't have lots of this information. And as most of these species, as, as you've seen from the talk from Owen and Vincent, lots of these species are becoming rarer and conservation is really important. And Ebony Forest, together with Lavani and the National Park and Conservation uh, Services, started uh, a project on a snail in 2019 and we received funding from the MBZ, the Mohamed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. And the goal of the project was to captive breed and release snails in the wild. And the goal of this project was to prevent native snail extinction using breeding programs and to protect and increase the number of native snails in a natural environment. So we decided to choose these following species to work on, the Pakistala bicolo, the Gonidus concamerata, Odifora eugenie, Erepta odondina, Teophilia cadeweli, Erepta stylodon, and Picadomus sucatus. So we chose these species because some of them were a mixture of vulnerable and also critically endangered species. So as we are, it's the first time we're working on a species, we wanted to learn a bit more. So we wanted to try it first on species that are a bit less close to extinction. So in January, 2019, we collected four other Pakisala Piccolo from Valle de Les on Mountain Camisa. And they were taken to Lavani Nature Park for captive breeding. They were put in outside enclosure. You can see a picture of the, of when we were in outside enclosure for a stay. And after one year, we had bred more than 300 individuals, and you can see them here, some of the big one and the small one. And we also tried to work on the Picodamus sucatus. So six adults and one juvenile were collected in Maccabi. They were also taken to Lavani to Capibot. Unfortunately, we didn't get any breeding, and all of them died. So that was a bit less successful compared to the Pakistala. But the good thing is that, at least for one species, we are now successfully breed quite a lot of them, more than 300. So the question we had now was where and how to release them. As I mentioned earlier on, we had not done anything like that uh, before in Mauritius. So we look into the literature and look what has been done elsewhere. And we found out that lots of project has been done in Hawaii, the Caribbean. Polynesia and also Sao Tome and Principe. And most of the project use an exclusion enclosure. So the exclusion is designed to exclude specific predators and competitors. And also they prevent the movement of individuals in and out of the exclosure. And all of them are based on the design of super fans that are used in New Zealand, but exclude all type of predators. And they are used for the concept of mainland island where you have like large areas where predators are excluded and there are fewer predators. So we started to work on our own design for the enclosure. So the first thing was to list all possible predators and competitors of the native snail. So I'm not, again, I'm just going to go quickly because Owen and Vincent talk about them. So it's wild pigs, rats, Shoes, ten wrecks, toads, and of course, exotic snails. So we had to work on a design that would exclude these predators. But what we wanted to do 
is also that these will be used as safe haven, this exposure, but the baby snail will be able to leave and, and colonize other areas. So we have this, more, this ex extra difficulty compared to other projects that have been done. So we, we work and we end up with this uh, type of uh, enclosure for the release. So it's made of a wire mesh, which allows small snails to go through, but the big ones not, and they're stuck in. And we also have a mesh cut that is uh, dug in the ground to exclude digging animals like uh, ten wreck, rats, and, and pigs. And also we have ups, uh, upside down gutters, which will in, uh, exclude climbing animals. We also use uh, copper wire, but you can see down here on these pictures, uh, because the copper wire, they would prevent snails from getting in, because when they go, the snail go over the copper, they get a, a little electric shock, kind of. So then this prevents them from. And we also use, if you can sit down on this picture, pitfalls, because sometimes we have toads that could go through. They are very small toads. The big one could not go through the mesh, but a small one went through. And we use pitfalls inside to capture these uh, uh, toads before they become too big and start predating on the snakes. And we also place in the area four automated good nature traps, which are set up to kill rats. And we hope by doing this, we will reduce the density of rat around the enclosure. And to see if the enclosure was working, we, pay, we place a rat bait inside and see if the rodents could be attracted. We tested the enclosure for more than three months. And during these three months, we had no of the uh, exotic species that we mentioned that came in. We had uh, small uh, toads, and they were caught by the pit so when we excluded. So having the enclosure working, we decided to release the snail. So we choose 50 of the bigger snails that were bred at Lavani. We translocated them to the enclosure at Valley de Les. But before release, each snail was given a unique color combination using nail varnish, as you can see in the picture in the middle. So we would be able to individually identify each snail. And we also took uh, morphometrics, so the weight, the length, and the width. And once all is done, the 50 snails were released in the enclosure and we monitor the enclosure regularly. So what do we mean by monitoring? Every month we go and we search systematically the whole enclosure. We turn out every leaves, everything, and we try to find the snail. And if a snail is found, we usually retake the same information we've done before. And if we found any toads in the pitfall, they are removed. So after nice month, we had, uh, we had released 50 snails and we have 44 snails that are still alive. And all the snails have grown. So you can see in the graphic uh, below, but we have been increasing the shell length, width and weight. So that means the snails are doing well. And also you can see on the picture, so the green dot used to be at the opening of the snails, so at the poacher. Now you see it grows back long deep. So that means that they are doing very well and growing in the end. But of course, they are growing doesn't mean the project was successful. But then we were quite lucky. So two weeks ago, we found 17 juveniles in uh, Pakistan in the enclosure. So now we can say that we are quite happy that the project was successful because we are excluding rats. The snail are growing and they're also reproducing. So now the next step we hope is that we'll get snails that will slowly start to move through the wire mesh and start colonizing forests around. So what's next? The next step for the project would be to collect more species for captive breeding, also build more enclosures in different suitable areas. And we also want to use uh, surrogate species to develop captive breeding techniques before we work on the critically endangered species. So we put, because as transaction and when also, but they are really rare. So we don't want to put more pressure. So we're going to work on uh, surrogate. Once we find a good technique, then we'll work on a critically endangered species. We also want to develop enclosure design for three species. And one thing that needs to be done, because some of it has been done, is to do red listing of snail species. So thank you very much. Oh, very good job. <laughs> That's all I have.
See, so now uh, if you have any question, you can either type the question or just uh, talk direct, uh, our the question directly. So Vincent uh, or me will be more than happy to answer your question. Well, I have a question to Vincent, if I may ask. Of course. Yes. All right. So just Vincent, you've, you've done a lot of ecological work in Mauritius. Have you had a chance to do similar sorts of studies in the reunion? And what's the situation uh, like there overall? Yeah, uh, no, no, uh, no such a work in La Reunion. We have done more like surveys of, um, in Reunion, the, the research has been mostly on uh, inventories of snails in areas with and without uh, alien plant weeding. It was the InVibio project. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't get uh, published. Uh, it was just a couple of uh, uh, con um, uh, conference proceedings. Um, but it was a very interesting project where we were kind of making very nice control experiment of removing edicum. Um, in, in the understory of forests in, in, in La Réunion and modifying the, the, the snails. But uh, um, overall, uh, it was a very, of course, uh, as you would, uh, we also saw in Mauritius, a, a kind of, um, it's not one size fits all kind of situation. Some species benefited, others actually uh, were very knocked down, like arboreal species were very much uh, suffering from the weeding, for example. So we have some, uh, Things like that. And also the other point of the general feeling is that, uh, yeah, in, in La Réunion is very hard to find snails uh, for some reason. They, 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 they tend to be much rarer than, um, I mean, sometimes you, you 